Before beginning, I'd like to ask a couple questions of everyone watching this video to think about. Do you have a campus network at your organization? Do you consider yourself a service provider? The reason I ask, everyone has a campus, ranging from a corporate park with multiple buildings or a school campus with hundreds or thousands of users to small remote offices or even the handful of users supporting a hyperscale data center. Everyone has some kind of campus network. Everyone is also a service provider. Think of it this way. You're not just providing a copper or fiber handoff, some demarcation point. You're providing a service. You're all providing connectivity to other resources in your network. You're providing services such as DHCP, internet, maybe NTP, DNS, authentication services, firewall services, etc. Everyone has a campus and is a service provider. Hi, my name is Vincent Slindro, and I'm a Juniper architect. I've worked with some of the largest internet exchanges, hosting companies, large retail organizations, automotive manufacturers, universities, online gaming companies. All of these organizations have talked about or are implementing eVPN. Before joining Juniper, I was the architect at Northwestern University in Chicago, where I ran MPLS and L2, L3 VPNs across the campus as a way to virtualize and segment the network, one of the first universities to do so. This video will help you see the similarities between the data center and the campus, how we got to where we are, what needs to change, and why. Then the five key concepts involved in the Evolved Campus Core Framework, finishing up with the three steps to move to an ECC architecture. All right, let's get started. Here, we see a typical circa's 90s three-tier architecture. At the time, the main player or the only player was Cisco. This is the classic core, distribution, access design. How many of you have either supported, deployed, or recommended this architecture in their careers? Would you still do that today? There is nothing wrong with this architecture. At the time, the devices had limited TCAM. There was a clear distinction between a router and a switch. Bridge routers, or layer 3 switches, were just being introduced. This architecture was in the ICND book, Interconnecting Network Devices, the CCNA book. It was a SRND, Solution Reference Network Design. Through the years, there have been slight variations, maybe combining the core and distribution layer, those top two layers together as hardware became more powerful. Based upon that, throughout this video, the core and distribution could be used interchangeably, depending on your actual deployment. Many campus environments are looking to refresh. They are wanting to refresh. You've squeezed everything and more out of these boxes. When looking to refresh the network, are you going to just replace the core devices with newer boxes, with better feeds and speeds like the past, like we've always been doing, and keep this 90s architecture? Let's take a look at how we got here, and I challenge you to rethink your network going forward. Here is a typical multi-site campus. We have two data centers, maybe a headquarters with a core of their own with multiple distribution switches, or a large building with a pair of distribution switches and a set of access layer switches per floor, or a few small offices with a switch per building. Again, we've all seen it, all valid campus deployments. What are the, some of the common problems though? Redundancy. Adding multiple links or redundant paths in case of a fiber cut or equipment issue is a good idea for redundancy in a switching environment, but that causes loops. And when we get loops, we need things like spanning tree or similar. When the campus is small, a 
a couple hundred or thousand devices on the network, not that big of a deal. But with laptops, smartphones, IP phones, that's just users. How about IoT, building automation, HVAC controls, IP surveillance cameras, many other devices on the network. The consumers of these networks have grown exponentially and evolved. But has the network? How does spanning tree work? There's an algorithm that determines loops. Then things like root port, forwarding and blocking port. Oh, with spanning tree, certain ports need to go into blocking state as a way to mitigate these loops. So that means we don't get to use all the available bandwidth. Well, that's not ideal. Given the simple topology, which ports are blocking? What info do you need? OK, how about now? Which port? Good. This was just a simple, redundant topology. Just imagine networks with hundreds of switches. Again, when things were small, a lot more manageable. As an industry, we've tried to get rid of spanning tree while maintaining redundancy. We've created these technologies to make multiple devices appear, act, and behave as a single device. We have virtual chassis or stacking. We've created virtual chassis fabric, multi-chassis lag or VPC, Junos Fusion, our competitor's fabric extender all built to alleviate spanning tree. But at some point, once you expand that network and connect that device or logical device to something else, we need to reintroduce spanning tree and we're back to flooding and learning. ARPs, GARPs, ask everyone, do they know who someone is? Or tell everyone who I am. We flood MAC address info across the entire broadcast domain. All of these technologies, though, have worked to some degree and have helped mitigate the need for spanning tree, especially when you carefully do all the calculations like we just saw. All have had their bumps as well. What is common, though, is that there is no interop between vendors in any of these technologies. It's rigid. Each vendor, while similar in concept, has their own specific implementation. Users. We all love our users and some of the unique and interesting challenges they ask of the network. Layer 2 adjacency. A lot of legacy apps are dumb or were programmed at a time when there was a single network. The app could have used some kind of flooding mechanism to exchange data or maybe local multicast. All requirements that necessitated to be part of the same L2 domain. All good when everyone is on the same switch. Segmentation. At some point, we figured out it was a bad idea to put everyone in the same slash 16 broadcast domain, all in the same VLAN. We saw that having these huge broadcast domains and flooding traffic wasn't a good thing. So we segmented even further. We went to slash 24s or even smaller with the help of VLSM. But were these the only reasons for segmentation? Let's take the following scenario. A professor or student, maybe a VP in engineering or finance. Before RBAC, role-based access control or identity-based firewalls, users were put into different VLANs, subnets, because either the floor that they were on or what department they belonged to. Each floor or department had a specific IP subnet assigned to them. These firewall rules were then configured based upon these subnets. All good and made total sense, or so we thought. How about if the user wanted to move? They got the new corner office on the 35th floor, or a tenured professor who has two offices. What were the options? Create new firewall rules since the user is now on a different subnet, 
or VLAN and have it look like Swiss cheese or just extend the VLAN. I think everyone knows what we've done collectively to address this problem. We just put the new port on the same VLAN. That's great if the other port is on the same switch. But how about if the professor's other office is on another switch on the same floor? How about a different floor? Different building? Different campus? We extended the VLAN still across various multiple routers, multiple switches, and this would have worked well if it were just one user or the single department, but <laughs> let's be honest, it was never just one. Now, here was just a few of the reasons on why we've built out campus networks like we have, as well as the challenges. All a little different, all a little unique. Relatively easy to manage individually at small scale, but difficult when everything is intertwined and magnified. All of these are problems every campus network has had to address. We've been trying to solve today's problems with protocols built years ago. Times have changed and the network needs to as well. Otherwise, all we are doing is perpetuating the same problems with just bigger and faster boxes. Here we have the various campus deployment models. There is a fit in place for each depending upon numerous factors. The one thing I want you to remember here is that we can take the same equipment and deploy it into these various models, with the key being Junos, one common operating system for all these deployments. Juniper's Campus Portfolio. At the core distribution, we have EX9200s, MX Series, and QFX. There are some reasons why some may choose one platform over the other at this level. It could be route scale, services, port density. Talk to your account team for which platform best suits your specific needs. At the Access, we have the EX family of switches, and for security, the various models of our SRX firewall, providing security through SDSN, software-defined secure networks, along with Sky ATP, and even virtual firewalls. ECC, Evolved Campus Core. One of Juniper's main tenants at its inception, separate the control from the forwarding plane. Data centers are moving to spine and leaf with an underlay and overlay. There must be some reason. Standards-based, leverages BGP, multi-protocol BGP to be precise, Lots of experience here at Juniper with BGP. EVPN provides separation of control and the forwarding plane. We still flood at the edge, but then use BGP to exchange MAC addresses with other devices. But why are they doing this? What types of problems are they trying to solve in the data center? Layer 2 adjacency? They too have legacy apps just like what we've seen in the campus. Maybe not the hyperscale guys, but everyone else. They may offer colo services and need to extend the network from one space in their DC to another location. VLAN limitations. VLANs can only scale to 4K. Microsegmentation. Getting rid of spanning tree. Flexibility. Any port on any VLAN anywhere. Their customers are demanding too. The data center and the collapsed campus core, not too different. In the data center, we have spines. In the campus, core distribution. There are leaves and there are access switches. There's compute in the DC and there are users, compute, as well as IoT in the campus. Similar set of challenges, layer 2 adjacency, VLANs. Getting rid of spanning tree, limiting of flooding and learning, as well as the flexibility our users require. With so many similarities, why not leverage eVPN in the campus? Why not leverage 
all the benefits that eVPN has to offer. Again, standards-based, large industry adoption of eVPN, minimized fault domains with a robust standards-based, highly scalable control plane. Easy to scale. If I need to add 40 gig, 100 gig, 200 gig interfaces in the access, I'm not locked into specific boxes, chassis limitations, or even vendors. All of the same advantages that a fabric has in the DC. But here's the difference and the key. With ECC architecture, there is no need for the access boxes to speak BGP, VXLAN, or even EVPN. Let me repeat that. No BGP, VXLAN, or EVPN required in the access. Just lag, LACP, and VLAN support. That's the beauty and the simplicity of ECC. EVPN VXLAN resides only in the core distribution layer, nothing at the access. The feature that ties everything together here for the campus is ESI lag, and I'll talk about it more in detail later on. But for now, just think of ESI lag as a way to do multi-chassis lag without complicated configs. EVPN, separation of control and forwarding. MAC addresses are not flooded across the core, but exchanged via BGP outside of the forwarding plane. This is perfect for Brownfield, unless you're lucky enough to build out an entirely net new campus. Operationally, nothing changes at the access layer either. All the knowledge, the skill sets of your existing network engineers, NOC, and operations staff, where the majority of Macs moves add changes occur, doesn't change at all. None of the configuration or troubleshooting changes at all in the access. All that stays the same. It's a win-win. Let me repeat that. Nothing operationally changes at the edge. That's huge. The access switches don't even have to be Juniper for ECC to work. They could be a competitor's. Again, truly Brownfield. Now, let's talk about ECC, Evolve Campus Core, a bit more in detail. Here are the five key concepts of ECC. Underlay, Overlay, EVPN VXLAN, VRF Segmentation, ESI Lag, and Anycast Gateway. These are the five key concepts they want to make sure everyone remembers and understands about the ECC framework. Underlay. Similar to what we have seen with virtualization on the compute side, we do with the network. On the compute side, we've started to build and amass a bank of general computing power. That's what we do with the underlay. We build out non-blocking networking capacity. One thing to note, when I say general, I don't mean white boxes per se. Just like in compute, you may need more memory in certain situations or maybe higher I.O. There will always be a need for purpose-built boxes. That's why we build custom networking ASICs and position them where they make sense. Lower latency, maybe increased queue depth. In the underlay, we are just building out high speed highly dense, non-blocking networking capacity. As far as configuration for the underlay, all you need is loopback reachability between the core distribution devices. Simplest way to achieve this is to use an IGP of your choice, OSPF, ISIS. You can even use BGP if you choose. Again, all that is needed is loopback reachability. Nothing new here. Overlay. Sticking with the compute virtualization, not too interesting when you have just some compute with nothing running on it. And instead of taking a physical server and running only one or two specific tasks, we said, hmm, 
let's get more efficient and leverage everything that we can out of that compute, be it efficiency, cost, sharing compute cycles. That's where the hypervisor comes in, allowing us to run VMs of physical machines like web, app, DB, on any server out of the cluster of computing nodes. Akin to the network, why would we build out separate physical networks for engineering, legal, finance? We should be able to run them all on the same network platform. Think of the enabling hypervisor for the network as Junos. We've been doing this since Juniper started, powering the internet and carrier networks through overlays like MPLS technologies, eVPN being built on some of the same concepts. We have the expertise as well as the heritage in Junos to be the best network operating system to provide overlay networking functionality. Overlay config, we enable eVPN and tell it the encapsulation is VXLAN. I'll get to the default gateway when we talk about AnyCast gateways. Extended VNI list. I put all for simplicity, but you can limit which VNIs, VXLAN network identifiers, are allowed to be encapsulated by eVPN. We also have BGP. Nothing special, just adding in family eVPN signaling. Not complicated at all. All that is is another NLRI. Network Layer Reachability Information. Think BGP capabilities. The ability to exchange MAC address info instead of IP addresses via BGP. Family INET VPN is another NLRI as well, just to support the segmentation piece. Is this complicated so far? VXLAN. VXLAN being the data encapsulation, we specify the VTEP source virtual tunnel endpoint as the loopback, a RD route distinguisher, a unique identifier for this tunnel, usually in the format of loopback colon unique number, VRF import. We restrict which VNIs to allow in. VRF target. Think of this as a BGP community, specifically here used to tag VNIs for the purposes of controlling which VNIs are accepted by the previous VRF import command. Then on the VLAN side, we just relate a VXLAN VNI virtual network identifier for each VLAN. We create a VXLAN VNI to VLAN mapping. Since VLAN stop at 4K, we just add 5000 to have some kind of simple mapping, but you can use any number. VRF segmentation. We've made VMs as an abstraction from physical hardware, just like VLANs to segment one user class or subnet from another. But how about if we wanted to take segmentation on the network to another level? On the compute side, not only are we able to create VMs of web, app, DB, we can group those VMs together as dev, test, or prod. Each environment could have identical VMs, but running in separate workspaces so that no environment is allowed to talk to the other unless we explicitly allowed them to. So how about if we take engineering, legal, and finance, and not only did we segment by VLANs, but we created their own isolated network here. We have blue, green, and red, all isolated from one another. How's that for segmentation and isolation? Making one virtual network secure from the other. So one may ask, how does engineering talk to finance? That is where we use a SRX firewall that is connected to each VRF, which can route and firewall between those various segments. You get the following benefits. Without segmentation, Everything is in the same routing table. Everyone has a route to everyone else. To protect or limit one subnet from talking to another, you'll have some unique ACLs. There is an air gap between segments by default. The only point that these segments cross is at the firewall. 
you have security and separation inherently by design. You explicitly have to create rules to allow traffic to cross between virtual networks, as well as allow routes between them. The rules become very clean and portable. Different networks aren't all grouped together. No need to detangle and see what effects something may have on another network when making changes. The view of the virtual network can truly be the inside, and outside, or internet. VRF config. We create the routing instance or container for the virtual network. Here we call it ri underscore faculty. We say it's a VRF, virtual routing and forwarding. We add the relative interfaces that should be part of this VRF. These are the routing interfaces for the subnets we created earlier. There is a RD, again, a unique identifier for this device. Remember, everything is exchanged via BGP. So we need to know the source of the routes. And again, the VRF target, essentially a BGP community that we use to control the import and exporting of routes, controlling which routes belong to which VRF. ESI lag, EVPN multi-homing active active. Everyone here has heard of multi-chassis lag. Take two unique devices, two unique control planes, and make a downstream device think it's a single unit. If you've ever looked at the config, it may be a little bit confusing, needing an ICL or ICCP link to sync control state between the two devices. One of the major advantages of ESI lag is its ability to scale past two devices to four or even higher. ESI lag is a bit of a different concept, so let's dive in a bit more. All ESI configuration happens at the core distribution layer. Everything I've showed you, config-wise, has only been at this layer. From the access point of view, it's just a normal lag. Nothing changes here. From the core distribution, we create an AE, aggregated Ethernet interface, in other terms, a port channel. Each AE interface has a single member on each core box in this example. We then give each AE a globally unique ESI, Ethernet Segment Identifier, which must be the same for each access layer switch. Again, globally unique identifier, but the same on each core going to the same access. We have 0001 configured on the right and left core going to the first access device, and then 0003 on both cores as well to access switch 3. Make sense? Think of these as unidirectional lags. From the access, it just sees an AE interface going up. Doesn't matter which core it hits to get traffic out. On the way back in, there is a table that contains a MAC to ESI mapping. So when traffic hits the core on the left and looks at the table, it sees that it's tied to ESI ending in 0001 and forwards traffic to access switch 1. Same thing happens if that traffic were to hit the right core. It looks at the table and again knows to send the traffic down ESI ending in 0001. This is what we call ESI lag. Looking at the config under the AE, we just add the ESI identifier. Easy. Nothing like MC lag configs. I mentioned it before regarding the access layer. For ECC, the access just needs to support VLANs, lag, and LACP. Anycast gateway. VRRP or HSRP works well, but traditionally only one device is active at any given time. So really you only have 50% usable bandwidth. In ECC, every gateway is active, hence the term Anycast Gateway. And not only are all devices active, but just like ESI lag, we can scale to four or more core distribution devices. In a failure, with VRP, the other device takes over routing, depending on what caused the failure 
And if there was a spanning tree event, this could take a bit and would affect all the traffic that was hitting that box. Sure, you could split VLANs half active on one, half active on the other, but hope your VLAN is not on the box that went down. In ECC, traffic is going to all the boxes, so there is real 50-50 chance or less with a four distribution deployment, there's a 25% probability that your traffic will be affected. The config for Anycast Gateway is simple as well. We create an IRB, also known as an SVI, given an IP address, and then specify the IP for the virtual gateway address. We add another piece of code under EVPN, default gateway do not advertise. This prevents the routers from re-advertising the gateways to each other, which would cause loops. So Vince, everything about ECC sounds great. I see the benefits, you've showed some configs, not too complex, maybe just something new or a little different. What are the next steps? How do I shift my campus to ECC? I've broken it down into the following three steps. We start with the physical. Evaluate the physical topology. Remember that three-tier architecture? If we look at ECC, the physical topology is similar, if not identical. Chances are that your network is already laid out this way. This is how we've built out networks for access layer redundancy. Your network may be different due to fiber or other limitations, and that's okay. It doesn't mean you can't move to an ECC framework you're just not going to receive the full redundancy benefits of eVPN multi-homing and Anycast Gateway for those singly connected access devices. Hardware and software. This architecture is called Evolved Campus Core. ECC revolves around the core distribution layer. In ECC, we can use any of the MX series routers, EX9200 switches, or the QFX 10K series, even the QFX 5110. Talk to your account team which one makes sense for your environment. If you already have one of these Juniper devices as the core distribution, then you're set. You just need to move to a version of Junos that supports eVPN VXLAN. At the access, we're vendor agnostic, not necessarily vendor indifferent. From our own portfolio, you can use the standard EX switch that you may already have, you can even use virtual chassis at the Axis, VCF, or even Fusion. The only access switch requirements are that it supports LAG, LACP, and VLANs. Last step is just enable ECC on those core devices. Underlay, Overlay, VRF Segmentation, ESI LAG, and Anycast Gateway, all of which were only configured on the core distribution devices. I've only been showing a single block for simplicity, but bring back that multi-node campus and when we configure ECC, you'll be able to satisfy the redundancy and user problems we talked about at the beginning of the video. You'll be able to have the professor with the two or more offices scattered about all be on the same subnet without trunking VLANs across the core. With ECC, you'll also be able to provide new services. For example, a movie lot with different stages that gets reconfigured or rented out for every new production, a conference center with multiple concurrent conferences running, a university which has a music hall or an athletic stadium that gets rented out for a special event. You can provide these transient overlay networks all totally isolated, being spun up and being torn down from your production everyday network. Think SDN for your campus. ECC takeaways. Why ECC? Redundancy and users. Eliminating spanning tree and providing layer two adjacency as well as segmentation and flexibility. The five ECC concepts. Underlay. Overlay with eVPN VXLAN. VRF segmentation, ESI lag, and Anycast gateway.
Lastly, migration. The three simple steps to move into an ECC evolved campus core framework. Physical, core devices and software that are capable of EVPN VXLAN, then just enabling ECC. After that, you'll start to enjoy all the benefits the Evolve Campus Core framework has to offer over that old traditional three-tier architecture. Thank you. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me or hit me up on Twitter. <laughs>